on Francis Bacon, from Letters on the English, or Lectures Philosophiques, circa 1778, by Voltaire. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On the Lord Bacon. Not long since the trite and frivolous question following was debated in a very polite and learned company, that is, who was the greatest man, Caesar, Alexander, Tamerlane, Cromwell, etc., etc. Somebody answered that Sir Isaac Newton excelled them all. The gentleman's assertion was very just, for if true greatness consists in having received from heaven a mighty genius, and in having employed it to enlighten our own mind and that of others, a man like Sir Isaac Newton, whose equal is hardly found in a thousand years, is the truly great man, and those politicians and conquerors, and all ages produce some, were generally so many illustrious wicked men. That man claims our respect who commands over the minds of the rest of the world by the force of truth, not those who enslave their fellow creatures. He who is acquainted with the universe, not they who deface it. Since, therefore, you desire me to give you an account of the famous personages whom England has given birth to, I shall begin with Lord Bacon, Mr. Locke, Sir Isaac Newton, etc. Afterwards, the warriors and ministers of state shall come in their order. I must begin with the celebrated Viscount Verulam, known in Europe by the name of Bacon, which was that of his family. His father had been Lord Keeper, and himself was a great many years Lord Chancellor under King James I. Nevertheless, amidst the intrigues of a court and the affairs of exalted employment, which alone were enough to engross his whole time, he yet found so much leisure for study as to make himself a great philosopher, a good historian, and an elegant writer. And a still more surprising circumstance is that he lived in an age in which the art of writing justly and elegantly was little known, much less true philosophy. Lord Bacon, as is the fate of man, was more esteemed after his death than in his lifetime. His enemies were in the British court, and his admirers were foreigners. When the Marquis de Fiat attended in England upon the Princess Henrietta Maria, daughter to Henry IV, whom Charles I had married, that minister went and visited the Lord Bacon, who, being at that time sick in his bed, received him with the curtains shut close. "'You resemble the angels,' said the Marquis to him. "'We see those beings spoken of perpetually, and we believe them superior to men, but are never allowed the consolation to see them. You know that this great man was accused of a crime very unbecoming a philosopher. I mean bribery and extortion. You know that he was sentenced by the House of Lords to pay a fine of about 400,000 French livres, to lose his peerage and his dignity of Chancellor. But in the present age, the English revere his memory to such a degree that they will scarce allow him to have been found guilty. In case you should ask what are my thoughts on this head, I shall answer you in the words which I heard the Lord Bolingbroke use on another occasion. Several gentlemen were speaking, in his company, of the avarice with which the late Duke of Marlborough had been charged, some examples whereof being given, the Lord Bolingbroke was appealed to, who, having been in the opposite party, might perhaps, without the imputation of indecency, have been allowed to clear up that matter. He was so great a man, replied his lordship, that I have forgotten his vices. I shall, therefore, confine myself to those things which so justly gain Lord Bacon the esteem of all Europe. The most singular and the best of all his pieces is that which, at this time, is the most useless and the least read. I mean his Novum Scientarium Organum. This is the scaffold with which the new philosophy was raised, and when the edifice was built, part of it at least, the scaffold was no longer of service. The Lord Bacon was not yet acquainted with nature, but then he knew, and pointed out, the several paths that lead to it. 
he had despised in his younger years the thing called philosophy in the universities, and did all that lay in his power to prevent those societies of men instituted to improve human reason from depraving it by their quiddities, their horrors of the vacuum, their substantial forms, and all those impertinent terms which not only ignorance had rendered venerable, but which had been made sacred by their being ridiculously blended with religion. He is the father of experimental philosophy. It must indeed be confessed that very surprising secrets had been found out before his time, the sea compass, printing, engraving on copper plates, oil painting, looking glasses, the art of restoring, in some measure, old men to their sight by spectacles, gunpowder, etc., had been discovered. A new world has been sought for, found, and conquered. Would not one suppose that these sublime discoveries had been made by the greatest philosophers, and in ages much more enlightened than in the present? But it was far otherwise. All these great changes happened in the most stupid and barbarous times. Chance only gave birth to most of those inventions, and it is very probable that what is called chance contributed very much to the discovery of America. At least, it has always been thought that Christopher Columbus undertook his voyage merely on the relation of a captain of a ship which a storm had driven as far westward as the Caribbean islands. Be this as it will, men had sailed round the world and could destroy cities by an artificial thunder more dreadful than the real one. But, then, they were not acquainted with the circulation of the blood, the weight of the air, the laws of motion, light, the number of our planets, etc., and a man who maintained a thesis on Aristotle's categories, on the universals a part re, or such like nonsense, was looked upon as a prodigy. The most astonishing, the most useful inventions, are not those which reflect the greatest honor on the human mind. It is to a mechanical instinct, which is found in many men, and not to true philosophy, that most arts owe their origin. The discovery of fire, the art of making bread, of melting and preparing metals, of building houses, and the invention of the shuttle are infinitely more beneficial to mankind than printing or the sea compass, and yet these arts were invented by uncultivated, savage men. What a prodigious use the Greeks and Romans made afterwards of mechanics! Nevertheless, they believed that there were crystal heavens, that the stars were small lamps which sometimes fell into the sea, and one of their greatest philosophers, after long researches, found that the stars were so many flints which had been detached from the earth. In a word, no one before the Lord Bacon was acquainted with experimental philosophy, nor would the several physical experiments which have been made since his time. Scarce one of them but is hinted at in his work, and he himself has made several. He made a kind of pneumatic engine by which he guessed the elasticity of the air. He approached on all sides, as it were, to the discovery of its weight, and had very near attained it, but some time after Torricelli seized upon his truth. In a little time experimental philosophy began to be cultivated on a sudden in most parts of Europe. It was a hidden treasure which the Lord Bacon had some notion of, and which all the philosophers, encouraged by his promises, endeavored to dig up. But that which surprised me most was to read in his work, in express terms, the new attraction, the invention of which is ascribed to Sir Isaac Newton. We must search, says Lord Bacon, whether there may not be a kind of magnetic power which operates between the earth and heavy bodies, between the moon and the ocean, between the planets, etc. In another place, he says, either heavy bodies must be carried towards the center of the earth, or must be reciprocally attracted by it, and in the latter case, it is evident that the nearer bodies in their falling draw towards the earth, the stronger they will attract one another. We must, says he, make an experiment to see whether the same clock will a faster on the top of a mountain or at the bottom of a mine, whether the strength of the weights decreases on the mountain and increases in the mine. It is probable that the earth has a true attractive power. This forerunner in philosophy was also an elegant writer, a historian, and a wit. His moral essays are greatly esteemed, but they were drawn up in the view of instructing rather than of pleasing, and, as they are not a satire upon mankind, like Rouchifaud's maxim, nor written upon a skeptical plan, like Montaigne's essays, they are not so much read as those two ingenious authors.
His history of Henry the Seventh was looked upon as a masterpiece. But how is it possible that our some persons can presume to compare so little a work with the history of our illustrious Thunus? Speaking about the famous impostor Perkin, son to a converted Jew, who assumed boldly the name of Richard the Fourth, King of England, at the instigation of the Duchess of Burgundy, and who disputed the crown with Henry the Seventh, the Lord Bacon writes as follows: quote, "At this time." the king began again to be haunted with sprites, by the magic and curious acts of the Lady Margaret, who raised up the ghost of Richard, Duke of York, second to King Edward the Fourth, to walk and vex the king. After such time as she, Margaret of Burgundy, thought he, Perkin Warbeck, was perfect in his lesson, she began to cast with herself from what coast this blazing star should first appear, and at what time it must be upon the horizon of Ireland for there had the like meteor strong influence before. End quote. Methinks our sagacious Thunus does not give in to such fustian, which formerly was looked upon as sublime, but in this age is justly called nonsense. End Voltaire, Letter 12 On the Lord Bacon Read by M. L. Cohen MojoMoo411.com that's M-O-J-O-M-O-V-E 411.com. Cleveland, Ohio, September 2007.